kill it all. Just yeah, just, just two drummers on. talking around the world. Um, <laughs> yeah, no big deal. It's been a it's been a fun year and a half watching this all take place because I mean you know we started doing like the live streaming thing in 2006 or no 2008. So it's been like 13 years of having these setups as norm. And like when I would do uh, Skype calls, it would be this setup and people would be like, dude, do you have like a TV studio? And it's like, well, no, but I mean, if you want to work for yourself, yeah, kinda. So, um, but yeah, now that now that it's the norm, it's awesome, man. I mean, I've, I've got people that know nothing about tech. We log in and I'm like, damn, what camera do you have? Like, that looks amazing, you know? And so it's, <laughs> it's a cool thing to watch happen and watch everybody especially musicians finally have the ability to to do some quality zoom lessons or skype lessons and make some extra income even if they don't want to go down the full like online drum lesson for the rest of your life path um which is most musicians don't want to do that they still want to have the freedom to gig and to have their life so it's cool right. now that they have that extra little bit of income when this whole thing is over they'll still have that option of anyone that asks for lessons even if they're in a hotel room they're like yeah i know how to do that i can set up a corner in the hotel room with a lamp and make it look good so it's cool exactly it's like unforeseen consequences of like a really bad situation but it's kind of like totally. the silver lining that came out of this yeah especially you know think about all the people non-musicians that now maybe change their life a little bit to spend more time with their family because they realize, well, I could do this from home and I actually don't hate my kids as much as I thought. And so <laughs> I think in the, you know, it's, it's a terribly tragic situation, but in the end it was a nice reset that most of humanity needed to just kind of reevaluate. Like when the world pressed pause on everyone, it was like, okay, when you get to go back to it, is that what you want to do? Were you truly happy doing whatever it was you were doing? Um, and only each person can answer that for themselves, but it was a great reevaluation time, you know? Yeah, that's awesome, man. Sorry, that's a great... I'm, I'm like already in podcast no, mode. We're, nice we're, like, mode. we're like interview mode. Did you, did you steal my <laughs> questions? Because you totally just like, answered one of them already. <laughs> okay. Anyways, no, cool, nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you too, man. Yeah, before, before we get started, like not yeah. to take up too much of your time, but dude, thank you so much for taking the time out of your ridiculously busy schedule, I'm sure. To, uh, to chat with me and to chat with us here at Patricia's Magazine, man. Like we, we, uh, we send out like emails to, you know, people and we're like, yeah, let's send an email to, you know, uh, let's send an email to Chris Coleman, you know, one of my idols. Let's send him an email sure. to Mike Johnson and see what happens. And it's like, we send these emails like thinking like maybe they'll respond, but in the back of our heads, we're like, these guys are way too busy. And when somebody responds, we're like, oh man, this is awesome. Like they're normal people and they actually yeah, I mean, understand the you situation, can, you know? You can never underestimate how much drummers love to talk about drums, no matter how, where they are in their career, you know? <laughs> like I told Amber as, as soon as COVID happened, Amber's my wife that usually schedules everything for me. I was like, anything that comes in podcast wise, just say yes. Don't even look it up and find out if it's legit. Just say yes. Cause I'm lonely and I just want to talk drums. Like, <laughs> I'll talk drums with anybody. I don't care if they got three listeners. Let's just talk drums. And honestly, most pros and amateurs, of course, but feel that way. Like, dude, yeah, I'll talk yeah. drums. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's cool. Exactly, man. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to kind of introduce myself and tell you a little bit about this project. So uh, I'm from the States, grew up uh, pretty much all over the place, born in Texas, grew up in New Jersey, a little bit of Ohio, spent some time in California. Um, wow. Started drumming when I was four. Um, I did drum corps for most of my like adolescent years. I'm sure you're okay. familiar with drum corps. Yep. Um, and I was in a progressive rock band for a little bit. We actually toured a little bit around with uh, Animals as Leaders when they first started. Okay. Uh, nice. in, like, the, in like the Maryland region. And then I decided it was cool to move to China. So I moved to China. Uh, and while I was there, I was like, I learned Chinese, uh, learned the culture a little bit. Uh, I was playing in a couple of Filipino uh, cover bands uh, as a drummer, which is kind of like insane. And I met a Spanish girl. Uh, from Valencia and of course as one does when you meet a Spanish girl in China you move to Spain basically you what have one to does. yeah yeah it's in the manual yeah. so <laughs> when I was uh, while I was here I realized that there's like there are tons of great drummers here but there were no like there's no media dedicated to drummers in the Spanish-speaking community 
There are a few. Mm-hmm. There were a few magazines that were in print a while ago, but during the crisis, they all closed or they they moved okay. to online platforms like Facebook groups and stuff like that. But there was no online magazine for drummers, and I got together with a couple other drummers here. Um, actually, Chiki Marin. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's a minor guy. Uh, yep. We got associated with him, and yeah, we just decided to start this thing up, this uh, Bateristas magazine. That's and awesome, here man. we are, man. We we've got three editions out. Uh, you're going to be in the fourth edition, which is pretty dope. We're really excited, and uh, so I just wanted to give you a, a little presentation of where you, where we're coming from. Yeah. That's awesome, man. I mean, that's that's the dream is just to spread this thing, this weird obsession that we all have to more <laughs> people. And it's you know, it's too bad that the language barrier is the barrier between the teaching. You know, I mean, obviously, no matter what language you speak, you can study the drumming of somebody, but it, it's always been a barrier for me since day one on YouTube of like, hey, you should do this in Chinese, you should do this in in Spanish, and it's like, ah. You yeah. have no idea how thin I'm spread already. It's not that I don't want to. Right. It's just that I do everything by myself. So it's exactly. not like I just farm that out to part of my staff. Like I'm here all by myself again. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, and that's that's part of being like a modern musical entrepreneur. But still, it, I think it's really cool that you're doing this. That's why I wanted to jump at the chance to do it. One, I mean, I follow you enough to know that everything you do is of quality. So I know that you wouldn't Thanks, be man. doing this on any lesser scale. So. It was Appreciate like, it. you know, that's why you didn't hear from Amber. It was like, okay, I want to c- contact you directly and let you know this isn't just something that my wife's putting on the calendar. Like, I want to do this. So thank you so I'm much, man. That it. means a lot to me. Thanks, bro. Um, so just, let's start this off. We're not even going to mention drums, actually. So <laughs> without mentioning drums at all, and don't hang up, uh, tell me about yourself and like, where did you grow up? Like, what music did you listen to as a kid? your hobbies and yeah just tell me a little bit about yourself without mentioning drumming yet sure so i was born in la but all of my memories are from where i live now which is northern california or the sacramento area uh, so moved here when i was like five and came from a divorced family my parents divorced right around the time that i was five so it was not traumatic because all of my memories are of having a divorced family. So I preferred it that way. I had my dad's side, my mom's side. I got presents at one house, got presents at the other house. So to me, it was very awkward to go to a buddy's house and see their parents kiss. I was like, oh gosh, why did your dad just kiss your mom? That's so gross. <laughs> my parents don't even talk. So yeah. that was kind of my my childhood. My family owned a, a car, an auto racing team and an auto racing business. So I grew up at the track watching cars and just knowing it definitely was not for me. And all of my boy cousins, all my, you know, my guys, they were they were so into it. And I was like, oh, how do I break this to the family that this is I'm just not I'm just not manly. I don't want to do this. Uh, So that was kind of my childhood. Then around, I guess, 13 is when I found my first passion, which was racing bikes, BMX bikes. And so I just did that full time and did that until uh, right around 18, turned pro. And then that was gonna be my life was just, uh, so I had, we call them sponsors instead of endorsements, but I had, you know, uh, a bike sponsor and travel around the world and race bikes and that was gonna be it. And then just at some point in time, there was the realization of how small the shelf life is of any sport compared to an art form. You know, art you can do until the day you die sport you can do until you peak and then it starts going downhill and so that's when i just started making my adjustments in my life um and other than that i just can tell you that since the age of like five or six the the, my first memories of being in school were coming home and telling my mom like i think i can do better than this teacher like they are not explaining this properly and my mom was like you're (laughs) out of your mind and i was like no i'm telling you like there's a better way to explain this so i've been obsessed with explanations analogies comparisons since my earliest memories wow that's great man and, and hey you passed the test you didn't mention drumming once so well done Boom. Man. Boom. i called it an art form <laughs> <laughs> speaking cryptically now nice man mm-hmm. all right so now let's hop right into drumming how did you get started drumming you went from bmx biking obsessed with it with with explanations and then this transition into drumming like how did that happen and yeah. and who was your influence or what was your influence to make that that crossover? Yeah, so drumming wasn't a choice. Um, I was in school band playing clarinet uh, and at, I think I was in third or fourth grade, so very young. 
uh, like six, seven years old. Um, and I just wasn't very good and I was struggling. And so the teacher honestly just moved me back to the drums and that was it. And so I came home with a bass drum mallet and I was like super bummed. And I was like crying, telling my mom, like they moved me to the stupid drums. Clarinet's the <laughs> coolest thing ever. And all the hot chicks are playing clarinet. And um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I, it was not a choice. I was not was okay crazy. with it at all. But that's where I got stuck for the year and playing bass drum in school band and just staring at Candace Alpert, who was the girl that got to play the suspended cymbal and the snare drum. So she had sticks and I didn't have sticks. I just had a bass drum mallet. So I was super bummed. And then I just, I don't know, the competitive side grew in me and I just thought, okay, by next year, I'm gonna be able to be the one with the sticks. So I asked my mom for private lessons and then both my parents supported it. So that's how I got started with drums. But definitely through my teenage years, I never considered myself a drummer, even though I was doing marching band, pep band, wind ensemble, vocal jazz ensemble. I mean, I, I filled up as many classes as I could per day with music because it was better than regular school. But I still <laughs> never considered myself teachers, a right? drummer. Yeah, exactly. Because they couldn't <laughs> explain anything. Um, but yeah, and uh, it. But I never considered myself a drummer. It was just always like. That's Mike, he's the BMX racer guy. I mean, I was the guy that literally rode my bike to school every day with my number plate on and had my BMX, you know, my state champion backpack. So I was the racer guy that also played drums. And then that was kind of how it was gonna go for a long time until I got in my first band at 16 and then got like, uh, I don't know, peer recognition. And once there was peer recognition from my friends and schoolmates like, oh my God, you're in a band, that's so cool. I was like, what? You guys always put me in the trash can for being in school band. And it's like, yeah, but now you're in a rock band and now you're our friend and now you can come <laughs> to the party. And I was like, what just happened? Um, and then, yeah, my ego wasn't strong enough to be like, you guys are losers for thinking that way. Instead, I was like, totally, yeah, I'm cool now. We should do that. I'll be more into the band <laughs> thing. So that's, I would say like right around senior year of high school is where things started to go, wow, maybe this drum, maybe I should take drums a little bit more seriously. Even though I was in private lessons since the age of six, and never ever stopped studying and obsessed over it. I just never, when I looked at my heroes, they were so far beyond anything I could comprehend. It just never seemed to me like I could be one of them or be a drummer. Right, I see what you mean. And who were those heroes of yours? Who were the influences when you, were, when you started to really get into drumming? Yeah, I mean, you know, Phil Collins was my first hero that I recognized as somebody that I thought I want to do that. I want to be like that person. But I think as far as the people I was idolizing over, Weckl was probably the first one that made the drum set seem like a very different instrument. Like I was playing something that he was, he was on a different planet, you know? And I just thought, do we really have the same setup? Because you're doing things that I just, I, I couldn't connect any of the dots between what I was working on and Dave Weckl's drumming where if maybe at that same time I listened to a Primus record, I could connect the dots between what I could do and what Tim Alexander was doing in Primus. But then when I would listen to Weckl, who then led me to Vinny and, and Dennis and, and that entire fusion, you know, thing, I, it was just so unachievable and didn't even know where to start. And so I, I, I enjoyed that. I mean, I still love finding anything I can in the world where the best of the best are I can't comprehend it because then it just lets me know that anything in the world is possible. So right. I would say Dave was definitely the, even still, I, anytime Dave Weckl is near Northern California, I go out of my way to go see it, see the show. I sit in the back. I don't, you know, I don't wait around and hang out with him. I just, and I've done a few events with him. So I, I, we could talk, but it's like, dude, you, I don't want to ruin that. You're my right. hero. I don't want to ruin that by like getting to know you. I'll right, just, right, right. <laughs> I watch and I drive home with my buddies like a kid going like, did you see that? And on that second song, he took the solo and it was crazy. I don't want to lose that feeling ever. Right, know? right. That's awesome, man. That's actually funny you mentioned that, like that Dave Weggle is one of your first principal influences because it's the same with me. Actually, when I saw the 1989 Modern Drum, uh, I think it was, no, the Buddy Rich Memorial Concert. Yep. With Vinny with, and Gab. Yeah, exactly. With Vinny. Yeah. Wow, man. That, that like just blew my mind. And I was like four years old, I think, when I saw that, the VHS back then. And I was like, dude, yeah. this, is, this is next level. And so he was my first. And then it opened, you know, opened the, the doors for all the other crazy fusion jazz guys. That and that was, that was the first, that was the first videotaped or 
um, recorded shed. So right. as soon as we all saw that, we all just thought, uh, I got to call two buddies and see if they can bring their kid over because <laughs> yeah. I want to do that. And, you know, especially because in that thing, even though we as drum nerds want to pit Vinny and Dave against each other, they have such unique vocabulary that if you allow yourself to put your bias aside, especially with Steve in the mix, they're all just speaking their own language one exactly. after another. And that's something I think that sheds, you know, in the early 2000s lost sight of it became this thing of how fast can you go? How fast can I go? Totally. But when you get multiple musicians together and it's like, dude, just speak. I just want to hear what you have to say. And if I can hint back at it, I'll do my best. But it's okay that I played a bunch of rock chops and then you played a bunch of jazz chops and then he or she played a bunch of fusion chops. Like, right. speak your language, say what you have to say. And I, I, it's funny how much I now go back to that same exact video and see Steve Gadd in such a different light. Like he's kind of the hero of the whole thing to me where in the early days, it's like, it was all Dave. Then I could finally accept Vinny and I was like, oh, never mind, Vinny dominated. Then 20 years later, I was like, wait a minute, I think Steve is the man. Yeah, because, you know? yeah, exactly, man. He was just in his pocket. Totally. He was like, yeah, you kids go ahead and have fun and do your little shootout. I'm going to play some some deep stuff, you know? And, and yeah, and so I think that um, that exact video was a big turning point for me, too, because I grew up with those videotapes, the DCI videotapes, um, you know, the Chad Smith one. Uh, that was my rock videotape and then i'd put in whoever the rod morgenstein one and then the dennis chambers one with john schofield or john mclaughlin excuse me john McLaughlin, and yeah, i yeah. would yeah i would go through all those videotapes on like a daily basis and that's when that obsession started like wow i know i have to go to my race tonight and race my bike but i can't wait to come home and watch uh dennis do those sweeps again you know um, <laughs> so yeah cool man nice so if if you hadn't taken the road as a professional drummer, what would you have liked to have pursued as a career? Oh, that, that's easy. I mean, I, I've known that since I was a kid, so I still don't think of myself really as a professional drummer, but I've just known since I was a kid, I just want to teach. Um, so I think I would have probably taught astronomy or astrophysics, I and mean, that's my other, I guess, passion is I'm yeah. very I, I follow that other account. In, yeah, <laughs> I'm a huge Astro facts with Mike. Yes, <laughs> love that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I just or history or anything that, you know, I love the concept even still of knowing that I could have a classroom full of people that don't want to be there, and I have one hour every day to completely change their mind and get them to be passionate about something. And I've been lucky enough to have great teachers in my past. You know, I kind of mentioned my school teachers, but as I got older. Um, especially with private lessons and I started picking my own teachers and choosing my teachers. I had some great teachers that showed me like, you know, how, uh, how different education is when the person that's delivering the information truly believes in what they're saying and is passionate about what they're saying. It's infectious. So I just would want to be a part of something like that, no matter if it's at a college level or even just a private, you know, one-on-one -on -one level. Cool, man. Yeah. I, I'm actually a full-time teacher. Like, uh, at Oh, five. really? Yeah, so I teach history in high school, uh, high school and uh, history and geography for uh, freshmen and sophomores here in, in Spain. That's actually kind of like That's the awesome. stable gig that allows me to do okay. the drumming stuff, you know. And actually, the past uh, two years, I was fully dedicated to drums. And like the pand when the pandemic happened, everything went, you know, just sure. went away. And I needed to get back into a stable gig. And I got a call from an international school just out of nowhere. I didn't even apply that had my CV like stored away from like five years ago. And they offered me this history job. And I said, yeah, wow. sure. And yeah, so for the past year, I went back to teaching full time history and geography. That's why I was in China, actually China, going to China. I, I taught in an international school there. And in my oh. free time, I was still playing drums. So, and it was yeah, only when I arrived that, here that I realized maybe I could, you know, make the transition to full-time drummer. And it was great, you know, everything was cool and I really enjoyed it. And I toured around Spain and Europe and we, we had a great time. I was in a lot of great bands, recorded a lot, but uh, I, it, there was a sacrifice because, you know, obviously sure. I spent less time with my wife and, and now I'm starting yeah. to realize how we started this conversation. It's like, you're starting to take note or like kind of reflect on what truly makes you happy. And now that I'm back in the classroom, I'm like, man, this is this is where I belong. This is really what I should be doing. And like drumming yeah. didn't, doesn't have to disappear. It just becomes 
a parallel road that kind of like sometimes gets closer and farther away from from the main path and and totally i mean drumming will never leave you and just like we said at the very very beginning um it it doesn't have a shelf life and it'll be there you could leave it you can come back you can start again after a 20-year break you can just dabble in it and then take it very seriously it doesn't matter but if like what you said what was going on with your life and what we had talked about about how people reevaluated things after the pandemic or during the pandemic excuse me i think it's just if you have your own personal compass and you just replace north with the word joy and you just steer that compass always towards joy then everything else kind of takes care of itself you know happiness and joy are very different things and happiness is the result of being in the process of joy I'm pretty sure i got that from a matthew mcconaughey speech but it really <laughs> rang true the first time I heard it. I was like, I was like, yeah, joy is the process. Happiness is the result. If I'm always going for happiness, I'll never catch it because I'll have reevaluated what happiness means to me by the time I get there. So I'll never be happy. But joy is in the process. And so if I'm always going towards what makes me happy in the moment, the joy of doing something, then I'm going to be fine, you know? And that's why when a lot of people come to me for advice on online lessons and how to start a business, you know, I think they're thinking it's probably the easiest way to make a living. And I just have to sometimes tell them, I just don't think this is going to make you happy. And the fact that it's not going to bring you any joy, it's going to be obvious on camera that you wished you were somewhere else. I, I can see every time someone makes a video, I can tell within five seconds, does that person wish they were touring or are they happy behind that camera right now um, right. or in front of that camera? And if you're not enjoying the process of doing that, you're going to be in a tricky place. And just like with you, I've reevaluated things for sure. I mean, the, before the pandemic, if I wasn't teaching a camp, I was on the road doing clinics, clinic tours and, and festivals and telling my wife, okay, when these things open back up again, cause she books everything for me, like let's slow down a bit. I don't, I don't need to say yes to every single one. Um, you know, and, and then there are ones that, bring me joy i i'm not saying this because of the we're on the podcast but if spain calls i've been to spain twice and both times i really enjoyed the culture that i got to experience while i was there and i came home more enriched than when i left and if i can't find a culture that's going to enrich me i don't really want to go to that place just to play drum set it's you know i'm sure you've been a part of it but it's it's a 12-hour flight just to play drums for 40 minutes and then come back home sometimes so I really need that place to, to enrich me and come home with a new perspective of like, okay, I'm a more open-minded human being now because of going to this place or that place. So yeah, the reevaluation of this last year and a half has I think been very important for all of us. Yeah, for sure, man. Absolutely. As far as like music careers go, like your music career and you know, everything that you've, I mean, you've dipped your toes in like every music pool that there is in the industry in reality touring drummer sessions drummer clinician you've been on movie soundtracks uh you know mtv on tv teacher website you know modern drummer everything you mean we, we can go on forever here but where do you find yourself most comfortable on stage in a live concert in the studio no. behind the camera or in a classroom um and i use the I, word classroom loosely obviously Sure. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I would consider my drum camps, whether I do them here or abroad, to be a classroom because it's a group of people. Of course, yeah. There's definitely an aspect of entertainment to that because just like what you do in high school, it's like, okay, I'm the center of attention for the next hour. I have to entertain with education. And so I, I do enjoy that quite a bit. I mean, I would say my most comfortable zone is definitely what I do for 90% of my living, which is... I sit in a room by myself and I make videos by myself. I imagine somebody on the other end of their computer, usually it's somebody that speaks English as a second language. So that helps me become a better translator of information uh, instead of just rattling off all this information as fast as possible. Um, and so, yeah, so I really enjoy that. And I didn't know that I was going to. I mean, when I started doing YouTube videos, making any video was such a nightmare technologically because I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't grow up doing that kind of stuff. And even my touring days, we missed out on any type of social media. We didn't have 
I think maybe MySpace had just started when I was touring, but we definitely weren't filming ourselves and making edits on the bus or anything like that. So when I started making videos, I really had no idea what I was doing. And then the more of them I made, I just, I just couldn't wait to make the next one. Um, touring as a rock musician definitely was not for me. I did it for six years straight with very little time off. And I think the hardest thing for me besides the lifestyle, cause I'm a really like clean, clean dude, like no drinking, no drugs, you know, nothing crazy. So it's me and a practice pad on a bus while everyone else is out partying. It was kind of a lonely life, but I could get by with that. What I couldn't get by with was that you have to set up your kit when you get to the venue in the morning and then you never play it until the show. And then the show in a rock band is memorized. I mean, it's, there's no improvisation. You're playing the album's songs. So to feel my entire progression on the instrument, just stop and stay in stasis for years at a time. I just couldn't handle that. I just, it, it drove me nuts. So that wasn't for me. Session drumming, I knew right away. I, I knew, I think I'm feeling a much worse feeling than Josh Fries is feeling when he does this um, or Matt Chamberlain because Matt Chamberlain was my my biggest idol for sure growing up uh, once I became like I would say in my 20s like really into drumming Matt was my guy so I wanted to be a session drummer and I talked to every producer I could and when I finally got those opportunities to record for people that I do know wasn't in a band with my dog's freaking out yeah um, <laughs> when I got those opportunities and I put the headphones on and the click came on and I was in the room I mean, I was paralyzed. Like I just couldn't think straight. I couldn't be me anymore. My hands didn't feel like my own hands. They were sweaty and they, they just didn't work, you know? And and I couldn't take direction. Like the producer would say, okay, that's great. Let's just relax the feel in that second verse. And I, I couldn't, it was like, look, man, you're just gonna get what you get. So I knew right away, wow, I am really not meant for this. And if I compare this feeling to teaching a private lesson the private lesson just soars through the roof so anyways it's not happening juno i know that you want your bone it's not happening she um, has an opinion so anyways, on this matter <laughs> she does well she's got a she's got an internal clock that is far superior to mine and she knows it's bone time so okay. we might at some point have to take a short break for me to give her her bone which is right no away. worries anyways um so yeah so i think that teaching is where i'm the happiest and i've I'm so happy that I had the opportunity, like you said, to dip my toe in so many areas because now I can pass those experiences on to my students. And I know for a fact what I love because I did get the chance, just like you did. Like you can walk away from touring once you've done it. It's really hard to walk away from something you've never done because it's just this dream in your head. Right. But now that you toured, you can tell your wife, hey, hun, i I'm not giving this up for you. I really don't like it as much as I enjoy teaching history in high school. I'm being honest right. with myself and I'm steering my ship towards joy, you know? Right. Sorry, that exactly was a right. super long winded answer. And I know you no have worries, to translate man. this. No worries. No, it's all good, man. It's all good. I do end up trimming a little bit of, of some of the stuff it, it, as long as it, you know, it, if it's Trim like it kind of like out. a reinforcement, <laughs> no, no. As long as it's, yeah. a, if it's something like reinforcing an idea that's like really relevant, I usually keep it. But if it, if it drags on a little bit and in that case, I, I do need to cut it just for words because we do have a limit of words, you know, words, Perfect. All, all, all the words. Um, all the words. <laughs> so what are your thoughts about how social media has changed the game for music and musicians and drummers? And, you know, like, yeah. do you feel like it's done all good things and everything that's coming out of this thing is, is, is good? Or do you think like we're missing the plot as a society or it's gone too far? You know, because there's there's kind of a big debate about how drummers yeah. are presenting themselves more for the image of social media and less for quality of play or musicianship. So my, I, I really wanted to ask this question for you because, you know, you do spend a lot of your time about like focusing on social media. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about how the game has changed because of social media. Yeah, I mean, I think it's exactly everything you just said. It has done <laughs> so many good things. Uh, it's brought so many people into light that we would have never known existed. Um, I think of the uh, the dude that plays for Rent on Broadway, uh, Raghav Meotra. Is that his name? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Vic Firth artist. But I mean, I would. How would I have known that the guy from Rent could play like that if without social media? Um, right. My my closest friends in the world right now, 
I only are I only became friends with them through social media, and then those became true friendships. But Eddie Thrower, I wouldn't know him without social media. Carter McLean wouldn't know him without social media. So I think there are some beautiful things about it for sure. It also gives us a daily opportunity to express ourselves to the world because there are times where it's like I can't hold this in. I just you know I just learned this. I can play it and I'm in a room by myself. Let me grab my camera and maybe I can get, you know, even if it's just for ego's sake, I wouldn't mind a few likes on this one. I worked my ass off to do this. It would be nice to get a few likes. So I, I get that side of things. I think that when you steer your ship away from joy and steer it towards recognition on social media, that's when things kind of go bad. Um, and I've seen that a lot. And I've also seen the companies pay way too much attention to it. We're going to put a heartbreak right there and I'm going to give her a bone so you don't have to edit out a bunch of whiny dog. Hold on. <laughs> no worries, man. Do your thing. All right. All right. Good girl. Try to knock the camera over. Thanks, sweetie. Okay. <laughs> no worries. In three, two, Nice. Uh, but yeah, I have seen, like I said, a lot of the the companies and the industry pay too much attention to it because if you think about it on a business level, they got blindsided by social media and all of a sudden their traditional marketing paths of put out a full page ad in a magazine and that's kind of all they did that got taken away from them. And so what they're trying to do by signing a lot of artists that are big on social media is they're basically buying that recognition and that trust that those artists have built up. I fully get that, but I do think there we all can feel that there's something wrong here. And it's it's just so I always call it like a second form of validation. What's your second form of validation? Like if you look at Carter McLean and you go, "Oh, big deal. He's got 40,000 likes. Like who cares? I mean, it's just Instagram. It's like, yeah, but he's also touring with Charlie Hunter. And he's also the drummer for the Lion King, Lion on, King Broadway. on Broadway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not not in Belgium in a side street somewhere, on Broadway. So it's he's like okay, he's the guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's the man. So he's got a second and third form of validation. Right. When I look at Aaron Sterling, it's like ah, he's funny on Instagram. It's like, but he's also John Mayer's drummer. So I think that that's a very important thing, and I think drum festivals are almost kind of a good way to look at it. If you if you are somebody on Instagram that, and that's all you've done is put your whole life into that, if you got added to a drum festival and you were sandwiched in between Weckl, Carter McLean, maybe me and a few other guys and girls, Anna Canellis, could you handle a 45 minute set? Or are, have you trained yourself to only play in 45 second bursts and to also be allowed to film that 27 times in a row to get the perfect take? So I think that having a second form of validation, whether it be a career in education or whatever it is, you need to have something else, at least in my opinion. If I was starting a drum company from scratch and I was signing artists, you being big on social media isn't enough. I need to know that you've done the wedding gigs that you didn't want to do. You wore a suit on days you didn't want to wear a suit. You you know, I mean, when you and I started talking, we hit on the Weckl, Gad, Kaliuta tape those are the things that bond us all together. And most pro drummers know exactly what that is because we've all obsessed over that same stuff. And I feel that there's there's something in that, that grind that we all went through. We tried touring, we tried session drumming, we tried it all that creates a professional drummer. I rarely think being a professional drummer is how good you are. Everyone's good. Um, when you get to a certain level, everyone's good. But there's something deeper there. You know, um, do you know uh, Miguel Yamas? Yeah, man, of course. Okay. Great example of like, ah, yeah, he's super fast and whatever. But then you watch him play with other musicians and you go, oh, never mind. He's one of the greatest musicians I've ever seen play. And he has massive ears and he actually doesn't cover up people. He helps them and he pushes them forward. And right. he has that second form of validation. And he's also doing sessions all the time. Third form right. of validation. So right. that's my thought on social media. It has been massively beneficial to a lot of people, but I don't think anyone should feel that by being big on social media, you've made it. There's a deeper level to the career path than that. True, man. You just, you just nailed it. Love, love your thoughts on that, on that topic. Um, you're a Meinl, Gretsch and Vic Firth guy. 
and you know you got a bunch of other great brands behind you um why did you choose those brands because i mean you're you're at the level where you basically have the choice at this point of which brands sure. want to work with you and you know why did you choose them what what brought you to choosing them apart from everybody else that's in that's in the industry what sets them apart yeah. for you i mean i can tell you an easy answer of why i'm currently with them which is different than why i chose them and the reason right. i'm with them right now is i hate to bring up this word again but i always reevaluate myself every few years everything i'm doing and if i reevaluated my gear right now and just said all right let's get rid of the endorsements i'm sick of dealing with it um, i'm just going to go buy some stuff not one single piece of my gear would change it would be Aquarian single ply coated heads on the top and bottom. It would be my snare drum. It would be my cymbals that I have on my kit. Nothing would change, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, that. so that's why I'm with the companies I'm with. And I, that's my advice to all my students that are getting into that world of endorsements is if, if you're being offered an endorsement by a company that isn't what you would go out and buy yourself, don't do it. Just wait. Just wait until you can get what you want. Um, and if, and if you can't get what you want, it's probably on you. Your, your career probably just isn't at that point that you deserve it. You have to face that hard fact and push yourself forward until you can do that. So that being said, Gretsch was pretty simple. I was with DW for a long time, like 14 years. That relationship had kind of come to an end. Love their drums, love, I mean, I'm, I'm still a DW hardware, so I have a great affinity for them. But I knew I was moving on and I knew my sound was changing and I went to NAM. I don't know, like 2000, 10-ish, um, whatever year the Gretsch Brooklyn series came out, that was the year I was at NAMM, and I went around with one drumstick, and I hit everybody's kits, Yamaha, Tama, I reset my mind that Tama is not rock, and Yamaha doesn't make motorcycles, and Gretsch isn't old, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean, it was just like, fresh yeah. start, don't <laughs> believe the hype, don't read the marketing, just go in and play drums, and I just hit every drum, and for some reason when I got to Gretsch, especially that Brooklyn series, I hit it and I just, it was like everything that was trapped in my head as a drum set, probably because I grew up listening to Phil Collins and Vinnie Caliuta and and at the, especially in my era of being a kid, no matter what you went into the studio with as a drum set, they put you on a Gretsch all the time. It was like the set, it was the P base of session drumming. You just, they were like, oh, don't worry about your drums. We're gonna use our Gretsch. So I had probably been brainwashed to think that that's what a great drum set sounds like, whether that, cause that's a personal opinion. So whether it's right or wrong. So that was Gretsch. Minel was just something where I just, they were pushing the boundaries of things that weren't happening at that time. Another, it was 10 years ago. People are very accustomed now to like the dark, nasty symbols. That was the wrong way to go 10 years ago. People were like, what is wrong with these? They're not even shiny. And I just, I loved it. And I had a camp that I taught uh, with Benny Greb. So that was my first experience playing minor cymbals 10 years ago. And I really fell in love with them hard, but I have to say it was Yost Nickel. Um, he was, him and Felix Lehrman were the two guys doing all the demos on Minel's website at that time. Right. Mm -hmm. And Minel was the first company ever to just film the drummers playing. And that was the demo. It was always just like crash, yeah. ting, yeah. bell. <laughs> so out of context. You know, I was like, well, yeah. Yeah, I was like, who plays a symbol like that? But all of a sudden I'm like, I don't know who this Jost Nickel guy is, but this is some of the best drumming I've ever heard in my life. He just happened to be doing it on minor cymbals, but I obsessed on those videos, man. I mean, I watched them every day and just fell in love. So, I mean, that's it. And Aquarian I've been with since I was 20 years old. So it's been 25 years with them and love them and i just have you know i've played all other heads no reason to change vic firth i've been with back now for about two years and honestly i think that between all of the stick brands i think they all make amazing sticks uh, so i would say that the reason i'm with vic firth is just their long-term dedication to education it's just a it's a much more natural partnership than any other stick brand i could be with right right right, right. nice man that's, that's i love that i love that you know your philosophy behind the equipment that you use and uh i think it's like you said it's often forgotten people think oh endorsement uh this you know whatever it is i'm gonna take it and it's like no in the end you have to think about your sound or else you yeah. you're not being authentic well, you're not being true to yourself and think about this too you know i mean what what do you want to come before your name so do i want to be cb 700 artist mike johnston 
or do I want to be Gretsch artist Mike Johnston? Like, it adds clout to your name to have these brands before it, and which and I have to say, which one feels right? When I think about Gretsch, I mean immediately it's like Phil Collins, his Gretsch logo. Then it's like Max Roach, Elvin. I mean, it's just, and then it's like, wait, what? Like the history is crazy. And then there's this deep desire. Like it's not even about drums. It's like I just want to be a part of that history. Right. I want 50 years from now people to be talking about Gretsch and be like, oh yeah. And then the guy that started online drum lessons, he was yeah. a part of it. And you right. know, so yeah. I mean, that legacy style of things. You know, I mean, yeah. when honestly, when I see you play a reflex pad, it's just it's something different. You know, it's like we both know as professional drummers like you can play on any pad in the world none of them make any difference like exactly the best pad in the world is the one that you practice on that's it totally every time <laughs> whether it's the side of your shoe or or a seventy thousand dollar gold-plated pad it does not matter as long as you practice on it buddy yeah. rich somehow figured it out without a reflex pad <laughs> yeah. but there is a branding to that company that a lot of us have chosen to be a part of and right. i'm one of those people carter's one of those people mark juliana totally. we believe in what that brand is about so that's right. kind of how endorsements work for me if i don't believe in the entire ethos and philosophy i'm just not going to do it totally man nailed it so uh okay yeah because we were i was gonna ask you where like whether you feel yourself more of a musician a drummer or a teacher and and we already touched on that about you yeah. know the fact that you you are definitely a teacher, teacher. uh at heart yeah uh so sarah thar we just interviewed her uh two weeks ago okay. and so usually what we do is whoever we interview we uh, blindly ask them to ask a question to the next person we interview without oh, okay. knowing who it is uh and she has this question for you and it's what keeps the fire burning inside you to keep playing music and striving especially in times like these wow well uh sarah was a, a one of the og students of mikeslessons.com back in the day what? so yeah <laughs> and now now i can't even play a tenth of what she plays <laughs> <laughs> so zero credit goes to me for what's going on in her life because okay. damn, um, she's just an absolute magician on the drum set. I mean, she exemplifies everything that is passionate about the instrument. And she's probably one of the best ambassadors we've had in a long time for the instrument. If somebody just said, hey, I don't really know much about the drums, who should I check out? She would be in my top three of like, I don't care whether you understand the drumming or not look at how much she loves this right. you know so uh big props to sarah i would say as far as what keeps me kind of striving and especially now that it's been 40 years of my life i've been doing this i'm still taking lessons right now and i think it's exactly what i've mentioned twice there is no there's no summit there's no peak there's you never ever top out there's no trophy that's awarded to like just so you know you're the best drummer to ever live like Vinny is still practicing. Buddy Rich was practicing and I mean, he was convinced that he was the best drummer that ever lived, but he was still <laughs> practicing every single day. And so that's it. I mean, right when you walk in the front door of my studio, the first thing you see in the lobby is this massive painting of Buddy Rich. Right. And it's like, it's at a moment that, and it's from a snapshot, it's from a picture that I really enjoyed and I know what concert it is. And it's the moment that he's feeling like, not yet. I'm still not there, you know, and he's probably in his 70s or 60s when he did that. So I think that that's what keeps me moving forward is just knowing that there is a forward to move into, if I can say that, you know, it's, it's just today, hopefully I'm better than tomorrow. And, um, and I would say, oddly enough, there is a backdoor side aspect of social media. That is a big push for me. And that is, even though are like you're a great example of this even though i don't comment on all your videos you know i saw it you know i liked it i watched it every once in a while every once in a while i'll get that dm from somebody that i really look up to that says hey man you're sounding really good and it's just like oh yes <laughs> you have no idea how much i've been just waiting you know i remember the first time jason mcgurr said something about my touch and i was like oh my god you're the king of touch. You're my idol of touch. Thank you for noticing because I haven't been practicing chops, licks, speed. I've only been practicing that. And I don't know if it ever comes across. And so 
I think that that's a motivator too. And I, I don't think it's shallow to be like, man, I, I really wish my idols would know that I'm trying hard, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Awesome, man. And uh, last last question here. Or well, not the last question. Actually, you have to tell me a question. You have to ask me a question for the next uh, oh. interviewee that we have. That we, we don't even know who the next person is going to be at this point. So what's your question for the next All person right. we're going to interview? My question is, how do you learn best? If I was to teach you something right now, would you prefer that I wrote it out for you? Would you prefer that I showed you a video of me playing it? Or would you prefer that I just looped the audio of it? Love it. That's awesome. That's a great question, man. All right, so so to end the interview, to end this this great conversation we're having, man, I, I could sit here and just like pick your brain and, and, and chat with yeah, you. Yeah, it doesn't feel like an interview. It sounds like we're just getting to know each other. Yeah, it's awesome, man. I mean, seriously, I'm having such a great time here. Um, so yeah, we usually do a survey. And so I'm just gonna just kind of tell you a couple of things. Uh, and you just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind, basically. Um, so drumstick, what's your preferred drumstick? Tell me, obviously it's a Vic Firth stick. Uh, and just yep. kind of tell me the, the model and the, yeah. That's a good question. Cause I've been playing prototypes for a year now. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just say the AJ1. Okay, AJ1, I'm gonna plug this out to save me a little time later. Uh, favorite drummer? Dave Weckl. All right. Uh, favorite band when you were growing up? Living Color. Video that blew your mind recently. Doesn't have to be related to music. Whew. Let's see here. Um, it was live and then I watched it a million times in a row and it was the start of the race of Formula One this past weekend in Imola, Italy. And it was Lewis Hamilton in the front, Max Verstappen in third, I think. They started the race and just, I mean, the amount of Red Bull cojones that Max <laughs> Verstappen must have had to just be like, no, I think I'm going to take this line and cut everyone off. It was it was brilliant, and he won the entire race. So the start of the most recent Formula One race. Nice. Uh, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton. The Beatles. The Beatles, and whatever you have to Jimmy say after that. <laughs> I don't care what you have to say after that, the Beatles. All right, the Beatles. I was going to say, you, you have Pearl to Jam kill one mix. of them. Who would you kill? And it's okay, the Beatles. Perfect. Oh. No, no, no yeah. just joking, just joking. <laughs> it, the question is like, uh, all of them are trapped in a burning building. Who do you have to, who do you save? You can only save one. You would save the Beatles. Oh, the Beatles. Yeah. Okay, hold it. Nice. Burn. Perfect. I, yeah. <laughs> Jimi Hendrix had a song about fire. There you go. Perfect. So he's right in his element. Um, yeah. define, define yourself in one word. Curious. Wow, that's the same word I chose. Uh, really? Is it, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's actually yeah. the kind of the philosophy of my teaching. I always tell my te my students the first day is like my rule in this class is that you have to be curious. That's literally the only rule in my class. So, uh, and that comes from the... my dad. My dad always taught me to be curious. He said, "Whatever you do in this life, the key to the key to anything in this world is being curious." Hundred percent. I couldn't agree yeah. more. Um, last one. Is it true that drummers are more intelligent and more attractive than bass players? Yeah. On a whole, it does seem that way. <laughs> um, okay. Got you. Yeah. 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 Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, bass players. I got to say, uh, it just kind of seems that way. Scott's bass lessons is up there. My man Scott's pretty intelligent, <laughs> not bad looking, um, but yeah. For sure. All right. So word association. I'm going to read off some drummers' names. You just tell me the first word or adjective that comes to your mind when you hear the drummers' name. Jason McGurr. Touch. I knew that was coming. Nandy Bichelle. Do you know who Nandy Bichelle is? No. You, did you see the recent Dave Grohl uh, drum challenge with the little the little girl oh, from yeah, London? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's yes, her? That's Nandy. That's Nandy. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Potential. Matt Garska. Hmm. 
Oh man, there's there's too many personal words from our uh, <laughs> <laughs> from our friendship. Um, I'd just say fire, but Dorothy not in Taylor. the social media sense. Sorry. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Yeah. Not in the emoji sense. Yeah. Um, exactly. Dorothy Taylor. Um, hope. I just know that I have the rest of my life to be great at this instrument because of her. Perfect. Man. Chris Coleman. Wow. Man. It's so tough uh, just because his, his personality almost overshadows how great he is as a drummer. You know, he's, he's such a beautiful human that we forget that he, if he, if he was more silent, we would recognize that he might be one of the greatest drummers to ever live. Um, All right, so that was like ultimate. 250 words. So you'll have Sorry. to cut it down. Ultimate. <laughs> ultimate. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. Um, Kristen Neddins. Um, absolutely love Kristen. Um, man. God, she, she's so German. Um, she and I mean that in the, it, I mean that as a massive compliment. She's totally. so efficient. She's so perfect. Um, I would say, ugh, an adjective for Kristen's tough. Uh, balanced. One second, man. I'll be right out. I'm, I have my band rehearsal in like five minutes. So, uh, <laughs> and somebody, and they came early for Spain. That's weird. That's really weird that they come early. Um, <laughs> and you you probably understand that. Um, Miguel Amas. Uh, the can't use fire can't use ultimate can't use ultimate fire um pinnacle all right el esteperiano sibiriano i'm not sure if you yeah yeah, yeah. Guy. the weed yeah, guy new, the weed guy in the massive like this new explosion of uh, yeah. social media presence um man I'm trying to think um oh um what is it called when you oh disruptor he's gonna change the game for sure disruptor yep sarah thaller just passion zebin drums um, man, what a good dude! I, I did a Tam Tam Festival with him. Yes, you did. Um, God, just beautiful, bonita. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right word for beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. Uh, okay. All right, in Bateristas Magazine, one word. Needed. Hey, Mike, listen, I could be here all day. Just, all, just you know, we're, all we're missing right now is to be outside in the beach together. Just like chat it right. up, man. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, stay in touch. Bro, I'm just happy I got a chance to know you. Knowing you on social media is one thing, but getting something like this, I feel like now we're truly friends and that, that means a lot to me. Thanks a lot, man. I would say exactly the same thing for you, man. I appreciate your time. Thank you, brother. And I'm going to send you um, the translation. I'll send you the actual transcription okay. when I'm done transcribing it. I'll translate it to Spanish. I'll send you the video as well. And probably what we're going to do is we're going to take a little clip of it and we're going to put it in social media too just to kind of get a little bit more diffusion. Um, awesome. And to close this out, I'm going to do a little screenshot pick here, if you don't mind. Let me do one of these. You tell me videos. when. All right, I'm gonna tell you when. Are you ready? Yep. <laughs> All right, one second. Oh shit! Sorry, I gotta make this thing big screen. Hey, one second. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One, two, three. Done. Mike. Um, man. And let me know too, like if you need anything le like leading up to this, even if you want like a little 20 second thing of me just saying something that you can use, you j just send me an email of anything you need and I'll, I can crank out some promo stuff for you. Appreciate it, man. Much appreciated. Thanks for your time. Take care. Big Later, brother. Juno over there as well. <laughs> and uh, keep on doing what you're doing, man. You're a huge inspiration.
Thanks, man. Appreciate it, brother. See you, bye. Later, buddy.